Adam. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Why don't you please stand with me and we'll do our responsive reading and start our worship service here this morning. Our responsive reading this morning is from Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wastes at the noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. There shall be no evil befall thee, neither shall thou be come near thy father. For he shall give the angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the yellow lion and the dragon shalt thou trample on your feet. <coughs> because he hath set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him in honor. Mm -hmm. With long life will I satisfy him and show him in my salvation. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, as we get started with our worship service here, we just pray, Lord, that truly we can find our rest and our salvation in you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would wipe us clean, Lord, that your grace and that your blood would wash over us so that we can count ourselves uh, worthy to stand in your presence through your sacrifice. So be with us, Lord. Lord Jesus, fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray for the gifts that we're going to receive today, that you would bless and be with them, and that you would bless and be with the giver of those gifts, that they would give with a generous and a cheerful heart, knowing that all things come from you and that all things will return to you. And Lord, we pray for our church that you would continue to bless and be with it as it continues to serve your message, which is the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and to be a light in the darkness, Lord, to help a world that has fallen. Lord Jesus, we love you. Be with us this morning, and we ask for this in your precious name. Amen. So today we're going to continue our, our brief... Uh, our brief series of Malachi, right? We're going to continue our brief series of Malachi. This week we're going to be in Malachi chapter 3. We're going to read verses 6 through 12. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. And uh, the, the title that I picked for this message is You Cannot Get Ahead of God. You Cannot Get Ahead of God. And I started thinking about this title because... In the last several weeks, especially with like all the elections and stuff that were going on, you would either hear the, the president's press secretary or, or the, the candidate's uh, campaign uh, spokesperson, and they would ask him stuff like, is the candidate going to do this? Is the president going to do this? Do you know what the president's planning on doing? Do you know what the vice president's planning on doing? And oftentimes those spokespeople give this answer where they say, well... I'm not going to get ahead of the president. I'm not going to get ahead of the vice president. Basically meaning, I don't have the information that ultimately is going to come from them. And when it comes to God, brothers and sisters, we can't get ahead of God. God is always going to be ahead of us. Always. We cannot get ahead of him. Let's recap a little bit just so we're kind of squared away where we left off last week with Malachi. When we left off last week with Malachi, we had the question that we left is, is the way you're worshiping God the best you can do? Right? I mean, the title of last week's message was, is that really the best you can do? 
is the way you're sacrificing to God the best you can do. And, and, and we kept on hammering home, is that the best you can do, right? I mean, God was upset. People were worshiping in ways they shouldn't be worshiping. They were sacrificing to God blind animals and defective animals and keeping the best for themselves, right? And God was upset about this. God was saying, why, why are you, you, you keeping the best for yourself? When you know even the, the, the political figures, the governors wouldn't accept these sacrifices, but you expect the Lord Almighty to accept these sacrifices. From that point in chapter 1 through chapter 2, Malachi continues to speak out against the Israelites this way. He even compares their behavior towards God to that of an unfaithful husband in the context of a marriage relationship, right? And that brings us to chapter 3. Now please keep in mind that, that which we said last week. That the whole point of Malachi was to, to rouse the people who had strayed to return to God, right? That was the whole point, to say, come on, return to God. Return to God. We know that you've strayed, but, but return to God. That was the whole point of Malachi. He, he wanted the Israelites to return to holding up their end of the bargain, right? There was a covenant between God and these people. And what is a covenant? A covenant is a contract between two people. And Malachi is saying, you're not holding up your end of the, of, the, uh, of the contract, Israelites. You need to come back to God. Now, I want to be clear about one thing, okay? Because, unfortunately, there's always the knock that when we preach on Malachi, it's the pastor trying to get guilt people into giving more in the weekly collection. That is absolutely not the point of this message. It is not. We're going to hear some things that are going to challenge us, okay? We're going to hear some things that maybe might, might tweak us a little bit, right? Or, or, or kind of prick us in the wrong way. But the reality is the Bible oftentimes teaches things that are hard to hear. There's things in there that are hard to hear about sexuality. There's things in there that are hard to hear about human sanctity. There's things in there that are uh, hard to hear about uh, marriage and divorce. And we can't run away from those things because they're in the scripture. So we have to learn those things, right? And this one is no different. This is one where the Bible teaches a, a hard lesson about when it comes to giving and generosity to God. All right? So I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. So Malachi chapter 3, we're going to pick up at verse 6. Malachi chapter 3, pick it up at verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will, will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that, that as we seek to understand your word which you have given us, as our authority, that you would bless it and that you would bless us. Fill this place with the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Fill our hearts with it, that we may be tender to the reading of your word. And fill our minds and our ears with the Holy Spirit, that we may be attentive to your word, that we may learn your word, that we may love your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, if you think about it, if you think about it, faith 
has, has a daring nature to it. It has an intrinsically daring nature to it. We understand that faith is the intersection where finite beings respond to an infinite God. It means that faith is choosing to trust what we by nature may not fully understand or, or may not fully control. Or as Karl Barth put it, faith is where the grace of God meets the fidelity of man, and that is where the righteous shall live. Now some of us might find that exciting, but many of us might find that challenging. I know I do, because by nature, I worry about everything. Everything. The reality is, human nature likes to have full understanding. Human nature craves full control. We think we can understand everything. And we think that we can control everything. We really want to be like God. But here's the thing. We're not God. So faith is not a break from reality. Faith is actually facing reality. The reality that we are not the infinite God. That we are quite fragile. What faith does is that it calls us to live as the finite creation of an infinite God. That's right. What, what faith is, is it calls us to live as the finite creation of an infinite God. One of the places where we can feel that loss of control or that sense of daring, or maybe even better stated, the ability to put our faith into action is in the call to give. Because we are called to be a giving and generous people. Pick it up again in verse 8 of what we just read. Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. Can you hear that? Do you hear the divine dare in that call to faith? This is the only time recorded where God says, test me. Test me. I dare you, right, is basically what he's saying. Brothers and sisters, to fully appreciate this challenge, we need to understand that God was restoring a partnership to be the managers of God's provisions. So God addresses us as, as mere mortals. He addresses us as the finite creatures that we are. Those who are not the ultimate source of anything. God speaks of the irony of such mere mortals, of finite beings, robbing him. Robbing he who is the source of everything. And it is not a matter of robbing God of resources, but of treating what God has given us as our own, or treating what God has given us as if it is due us. What God is doing here is he's confronting the people for failing to be partners in their communal needs, right? For not living up to the covenant. These people were called to be a nation of people united under God with a responsibility to honor God and to care for one another. That included giving the first tenth of what they gained in the storehouses where it would be provided for the place and provision of worship. And along with the offerings, they would serve the needs of those who needed it. It was part of establishing the reign of God over his people. He was, in essence, declaring, I, God, Yahweh, am your king. And you are now giving to that kingdom community. You see, God had formed them to understand 
that their communal needs were not simply a matter of praying that God would provide, but understanding that they were partners with God. That he was providing to them what they were to set aside as provisions to meet the needs of others. Brothers and sisters, consider this. We tend to think that there are two ways to think about material resources in our lives. The one way is we tend to think that we are the, the source of all of our life's resources. So what we get, we own because we earned it, right? That's one way. The other way to think is to recognize that life's resources didn't originate from us. So we may see God as the giver. He is the provider. And in some sense, we are recipients of God's grace as we live and follow his plan. But God says, that we are managing partners also. We are managing partners in that provision. And he provides to us, and he also provides through us to others. So God is confronting his people that they are not being faithful partners in the covenant. And what is a faithful partner after all? Well, if you go just by the definition, a faithful partner is literally a partner that is filled with faith. And from what we've read here this morning, the Israelites were not operating as faithful partners. Too often, brothers and sisters, we find that our relationship to money and giving usually reveals the level, the level of our faith more than anything else. So knowing that, we see that God confronts his people that they might, they might have been thinking that everything was fine. They're sitting there carrying on some form of religion as we talked about last week in chapter 1, whatever that is. But God reveals that our relationship to money reveals a lot about us. So what does it reveal? Let's talk about a few points. First, giving represents trust and faith. It is the essence of the relationship that God wants with you. Do you hear the heart of God in these words today? The heart of God is not about money. The heart of God is about trust. God is after the heart of the people. He's after my heart. And he's after your heart. You know what reminds me? When you're a parent, right, you go through the drive thru or something and you get some food and you got some of your kids sitting in the front seat and you pass out the food and you give them their fries or whatever and they're all excited to get the fries from you but when they're holding the fries, man, if you go in to grab a fry from them, man, they close up their hands, they pull it close, they cover it up and they begin to, to fear sharing it because at that moment what's happening is that they begin to trust what was given more than they trust the giver who gave. We naturally think how ridiculous they are, but the reality is we're kind of like that with the stuff that God gives us. It's like, thank you, God. And then you take it and you hide it from them, right? And you go and swirl away. Brothers and sisters, when we give, when we give, it represents trust in God. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 9, your giving proves the reality of your faith. Your giving proves the reality of your faith. Why do you think we have sayings in our culture like, put your money where your mouth is? Right? That's why we have those kinds of sayings. If you believe it, put your money in it. Right? We have those sayings in our culture. Secondly, giving helps restore our role as partners with God. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Here, God is revealing our true position in relationship to all of life's resources. God is saying, I have created a world full of goodness and full of provision. 
I have created you, mankind, with the capacity to help manage those resources. God provides the life-providing plants, the soil, the water, the sun, and we manage the process. All provided by God. All managed by mankind under God's divine providence. I think maybe describing ourselves as managing partners isn't totally accurate. I think it might even be more accurate to say that we're subordinate partners, right? Where God is the executive, God has ultimate authority, but we have this managing partnership. It's kind of like the phrase you hear me say all the time that I got from J.I. Packer, that God is 100% sovereign, but mankind is still 100% accountable for all of their decisions. And those two things live side by side in the scriptures. Right? God's in control of everything, and we're responsible for every decision we make. Right? Just because God's in control of everything doesn't mean if you stand here right at the front of the building and wait for a semi-truck that's buzzing by and you jump out and surprise the truck, that you're not going to get run over. Right? That was still a dumb decision on your part. Our entire relationship, brothers and sisters, with money and life's possessions is one of being managers of stuff that's not fundamentally ours. And if you think it is fundamentally yours, let me know what happens to all your stuff once you're in the grave. Because it don't go with you. It don't go with you. But it has been extended to us for our care. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. Belong to the Lord. This is the fundamental truth that should define every aspect of ours when it comes to managing money. And this is really important. Because more than we know, human nature has become one that is filled with and fighting for control with God. We're constantly fighting for control with God. No, God, I want to be in control. No, God, I want to be in control. And that's difficult to our human nature because we want to be in control. Brothers and sisters, when we start to think that God just wants our stuff, and this is where it becomes an issue, even in the subtlest sense, then it starts to elicit obligation. It starts to elicit resentment. It starts to elicit negotiation, right? Just like my grandpa, I can still hear his voice sitting at the restaurant. every time. Every, so my family's restaurant, my dad, it didn't matter if he knew him or didn't know them. If a priest came in dressed as a priest, or if nuns came in dressed in their nun clothes, right? My dad always picked up their dinner, always. And he would always tell me, Vince, we're supposed to take care of the priests and the nuns, right? That was my dad. But my grandpa, if he was in there, every time he would see a priest come in, he'd be like, yep, there he is, must be wanting a free meal tonight. <laughs> right, because his heart wasn't right, right? He, he was thinking about it as far as in terms of control of my stuff and not about as a sacrifice, right? And there's the difference. So here's the question for you. Does your giving reflect your time, your treasures, and your talents, which ultimately come from God and which God has entered you into a partnership with him? And to whom you ultimately will give an accounting to. Ultimately, we all will. God here is saying that the Israelites are guilty. And he is calling them to be restored to partnership. And that same call goes for all of us today. We like to talk about God providing. But God has provided to us, brothers and sisters. And that is what giving is about. God challenges us to give and to restore our role as a partner with God. You know, I have this one story that happened to me. And you want to talk about trust and giving and all this stuff? There was one time, now, I'll, I'm not going to sit here. My wife, anyway, 
I struggle with ever telling anybody that we ever need anything, right? That is just not the way we are. But the reality is that when you have four kids on one income, unless you're like one of the Kardashians or related to the president, you're struggling, right? There's always a need for money and things are always tight. Things are always tight. And I remember this one time about two years ago, we were particularly tight, okay? And someone had given us a $200 gift card to go eat at uh, Brown Derby, okay? So we did a bunch of math crunching on the, on, online and figured out that all six of us could go and eat for 200 bucks with tip if we ate X, Y, and Z, okay? Because this was like close to Christmas, we didn't have a lot of money, blah, blah, blah. We left the house, and my wife was going to the store, and I had the kids, we had to go to this other store, last, last things at books, to get something for the boys. And we were going to meet at the Brown Derby, okay? So we go in there. I had $30 on me. My wife said the boys are allowed to have 20 bucks, okay? So while the boys are going around doing their searching, whatever, I came across this really nice Bible that is actually a collector's item. It's tough to find. I have a copy of it, but it's hard to find. And it was, they had it there, and it was in really good shape for like $8.50, okay? So I took a picture of it, and I shared it on my Facebook page, and I said, hey, if anybody needs a Bible, get down to Last Things of Books. They got this one. It's collectible. It's really good. It's, it's under 10 bucks. Come get it, all right? Oh, God, man, wouldn't you know it? Within a minute, I get a text message. Hey, Vince, it's Brian. Pick up that Bible for me, and I'll swing by your house tonight, and I'll get it for you. I now find myself in a dilemma. Because if I buy this book, that means I don't even have a single dollar in my pocket with the kids. And Mr. Worry and Control, I hate driving around town without a single dollar in my pocket. It makes me nervous, right? I, I might need something or whatever. So I was going to ignore the text. I'm like, I just pretend like I don't see it. And then I got this nagging feeling, like maybe this guy really needs this Bible and I'm gonna, you know, whatever, I'm being an impediment to God. You know, I start thinking these things and I said, okay, Lord, I'm just gonna trust you. I'm buying this Bible. So we go up and we pay. When it was all said and done, all I had on me was like 27 cents was the change from the 30 bucks that I had, right? Then I get in my car, and I'm driving, and I'm like, this guy's not going to pick it up. You know, like all these things start going through my head, right? So we get to, to Brown Derby, and we sit down, and we had reservations, and my wife is not there, okay? 15 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes go by, still no glory, right? I can't get a hold of her because you're not going to believe this, but my wife's phone is dead. That's a lie. My wife's phone is always dead. <laughs> so I can't get a hold. I have no idea what's happening. The kids are at the table. They're crying like, Dad, can we get a pop? Dad, can we get appetizers? I'm like, no, you guys can't get anything because if mom doesn't show up, I have no money. <laughs> so we're literally just sitting at this table. While I'm sitting there, I get a text message from Brian. He goes, hey, you guys are going to be at the Brown Derby in Streetsboro. I live right by there. I'm going to swing by and pick up that Bible and pay you. I'm like, okay. So he messages me. And I go out to the parking lot, and I give it to him, and I said, here you go. He said, how much was it? I said, it was $8.50. He's like, all right. So I give him the Bible. He puts, like, money in my hand, and I, and I feel that there's more in there than, than $8.50. And I unfold it all, and he gave me $100. And I said, Brian, what the heck are you doing? He said, you know, Vince, like three weeks ago, I just felt this thing that I wanted to give you a little gift and I didn't know what the right opportunity was gonna be and I thought this was it. To this day, I get goosebumps when I think about that story. So I walked in and the kids were like, Dad, what happened out there? I said, I don't know, but let's order some appetizers. <laughs> they, were, they were so happy and we ended up being two hours and 15 minutes late. So, I don't know, some tale of woe happened, but whatever. But the reality is, in that moment, if I would have said, no, I'm gonna ignore this text, I would have had 10 bucks on me instead of 90 bucks on me, right? 
I still remember that to this day. I still remember that to this day. Number three, giving confronts the power that money claims over us. Giving confronts the power that money claims over us. Brothers and sisters, God sees how the power of money is taking control of people's lives in our culture. Part of thinking we're in control is to think that we're in control through money, but not by money. But God sees that there is a spiritual force that money can represent, and when it does, it, is the most, it has the most powerful claim on us. No culture, I believe, has been as dominantly materialistic as the culture that we're in today. It's not even close, and it's getting worse. And there are more forces telling us that you can find happiness or value in something material. Our culture tells us that our net worth and our self-worth are connected, right? That our net worth and our self-worth are connected, but they're not. You know, in just a couple weeks, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving, which is probably one of the best secular attempts in human history to stop and be thankful for what we have. But before we even leave the dinner table, Black Friday will be among us. And I don't even know how, how it's going to look this year with all of the restrictions. But we, before we even leave the table for being thankful, we're told that we should go out and buy as much as we possibly can because it's all on deep discount. I went out on, on Black Friday one time in my life. And that's probably the, the most afraid I've been of being trampled that I've ever been in my entire life. Over stupid stuff. TVs and dishes and, you know, crock pots. I've never seen people so excited over a crock pot in my entire life as I did the one year I went out for Black Friday. Brothers and sisters, the money isn't evil, but there is a spiritual dynamic to the power of attachments that money represents. Money has been given the power to claim that it can provide value and security and happiness, but Jesus says quite harshly in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And notice that Jesus didn't say you should not serve God and money. He said you cannot serve God and money. And there's a big difference. And there's a difference in the way the world thinks. When I started in 2007 to go back for my master's in theology, I've shared this story with you before. You want to know how the world thinks? My dad stops me and says, you got to be the biggest dummy of all time. I said, why? He said, you're going into debt to study the Bible? Go into debt and get your law degree, and then you'll be rich. And my dad wasn't wrong from a worldly standpoint. But that's not what I was called to do. So to him, it's insane to go into debt to learn how to, to learn the Bible and to learn your, your theology. Brothers and sisters, giving confronts the power of materialism. Actually, giving is the cure for this kind of materialism. First Timothy chapter 6 says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will take hold of the life that is true life. How does the scripture say that we will overcome materialism? By giving. Materialism is about Getting And the only antidote, and the only antidote that will work against materialism is giving. Few people want to believe that they're materialistic, but God says, check your grip. How much are you clinging to stuff? How much are you clinging to stuff? Number four, giving faithfully reveals our character. In other words, it shows what kind of heart you really have. It shows, do I have a selfish heart or do I have an unselfish heart? Do I have a generous heart or do I have a stingy heart? Giving, generosity, shows what your heart is like. In fact, the Bible says that God uses money to test 
what is really inside you. And he uses money to test and see if you can be trusted with more. And he says if you're faithful with little things, he will put you in charge of big things. And Jesus wanted us to understand this. In Luke 16, Jesus said, if you are untrustworthy in worldly wealth, who will trust you with the riches of heaven? Think about that. If we think that we can separate the material world and the spiritual world, we're wrong. We may think that our spiritual nature can be separated from how we relate to material possessions, but we're wrong. God looks at how we manage material wealth. Does, does how we use our material wealth show that we are committed to God's purposes? Does it reflect that we're responsible to communal responsibility? In another couple of weeks, they're going to start showing Christmas movies all the time. And A Christmas Carol is seriously my favorite one. I've watched every version just about of A Christmas Carol. And notice how much material wealth Ebenezer Scrooge had and was miserable. While the family of Mr. Cratchit had nothing and they were joyful. Right? Because everything with Scrooge was this. Scrooge was so stingy, he wouldn't even buy himself good food. He ate gruel and stuff like that. I was watching, I'm like, you know, for Pete's sake, you'd think he'd at least buy himself a steak once in a while. He was miserable, he wouldn't even eat. Because all he thought about was more, more, more money, right? More stuff around him. When did Ebenezer Scrooge become happy? When he gave. When he gave. He finally found joy. He finally found joy. You guys know how much I love buying Bibles. And I've said it a million times. You know the only thing that makes me happier than buying a Bible? When I get to give a Bible away. It's one of my favorite things to do. All, I, I even need to just get a glimpse that someone needs a Bible. And I literally can't wait to give them one of them. I love it. Absolutely love it. Number five, giving generously, generously expands our world. And it expands the scope of our influence. Proverbs 11.24 says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And Psalms 112 says, Those who give generously to those in need will never be forgotten. They will have influence and honor. Giving to God's purpose influences eternity, and it invests in eternity. There is absolutely, brothers and sisters, nothing wrong with using money to meet our temporal needs, and even to enjoy it, all things were given to us by God for our enjoyment. But the temporal needs are, by definition, temporary. That's why they're called temporal whether a meal that lasts an hour or a material possession that lasts years, it's still temporal. But that which reflects God's kingdom, his will, his rule, will have no end. And God dares us to enjoy greater influence through our giving. And number six, the last one, giving in faith creates the opportunity to experience God's provision. Just go back to my story a moment ago. I would not have experienced that had I not given it in faith. Had I not given it in faith, I would have lost out on that. As God said in Malachi, he wants to show that he is faithful. And he can't do that before we give. Because if we don't give, it's removing the trust that we're supposed to have in God. In faith. Rather, God calls on us to give and experience how he will provide. Pick it up at verse 10. See if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it ripes, says the Lord Almighty. Brothers and sisters, God challenges us us to give so that we may experience his provision. You know, a dear friend of mine, not too long ago, said this to me. He said, you know, Vince, I'm happy that I'm not rich. 
Because if I were rich and I never had to worry about money, I would never rely on God. There's some truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. Brothers and sisters, we need to develop a life pattern of giving that reflects our faith. We need to develop a life pattern of giving that reflects our faith. Because we live in a world that likes to capture bigger than life dramatic moments, selfie moments, and it can focus on dreaming of, of one day doing something huge. But faith is a way of life. It's not reflected in a life moment. It's reflected in a life pattern. We live our faith daily, not in a moment. A life pattern is the way a person structures their life. A pattern is built or drawn from the values that a person develops over time. These values come from our many sources, our family, our friends, but ultimately they should come from God. So when a person becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, they are discovering, or rather, they are entering into a whole new understanding of what reality is. And our maturity involves a process of reorienting our perspectives and our life patterns. Our giving needs to come from a heart that has been renewed. A heart that has been renewed through the grace of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, rules can teach us, but they can't change us. Rules can teach us, but they can't change us. God had set forth laws, and those laws revealed obliga obligations. Those rules, those laws revealed how we have no ability to claim that we are perfect and how we are unable to earn the love of God. And that is where we meet Jesus Christ. When we receive life, he begins to form hearts that are actually desirous of entering into a partnership with God. When we comprehend the grace of God, what he has done in the giving of himself it becomes the greatest joy to invest our lives and resources into helping the spread of that grace. Brothers and sisters, I'm going I'm to close this whole thing now with the word of God. Because I don't think there's a better way to sum this that is found in the scriptures. I'm going to close this with a few verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 starting at verse 6 as we close. Remember this, brothers and sisters. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now he who supplies to the so he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will resu result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. What a great verse and what a great reminder of what God expects from his people. Amen? Amen. Amen. It, sh it, it It's hard. It's hard, brothers and sisters. But this is what God requires. And God did not spare the most valuable thing that he had for us. And that's something we should always remember. Giving is not only done monetarily. Giving also comes through service. 
and how we can give of our time and how we can give of our talents. And I think that brings us also to our, to our challenge, right, and what we continue to pray for. We pray for two people that don't know the Lord that you may be able to share the message with them because we should be. Are we praying for two people that we've lost touch with to reconnect that connection because we should be? The last thing, are we praying for two obstacles that prevent us from our ministry? Is giving and generosity an obstacle? Is, is lack of service an obstacle to your ministry? Pray for those things and pray that God brings to your mind ways that those things can be overcome. It's a challenging part of scripture, but it's in the scriptures. What we just read is in there, which means God intends it for us. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your instruction. And Lord, even the hard parts of the Bible are there for our good. So Lord, help us renew within us a generous heart, a, a cheerfully generous heart that we may learn how to, how to give to your kingdom and that we may learn how to serve your kingdom with everything that we have because everything that we have ultimately comes from you. Lord Jesus, be with us as we leave this day. Impart your Holy Spirit to us as an ever-present reminder of these things and know that we love you. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday, and Lord willing, we will see each other again next week. Amen.